Once again, our special guest has been Professor Daniel Dennett of Tufts University, author of the controversial new book, Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomena. As a youth now, can you tell me how you first got interested in science? Well, I got some books that had a wonderful, for children, well, not for children, for young adults, a, account of, of Einstein's theory of relativity, and I read that through and got fascinated with it. But actually, I, I didn't study science very, very much in school. I was a, I, in college, I was a philosophy major. I didn't really get into science until I was in graduate school when I decided I really wanted to understand how the human mind worked. And to do that, you had to know psychology, you had to know neuroscience, you had to know artificial intelligence. So I began to educate myself in those fields. Well, then, what was it, what was, what was it about philosophy as a youth that got you interested? Well, I think a lot of kids ask philosophical questions without thinking of it as philosophy. Just, why are we here? What's the nature of truth? What's the nature of reality? Uh, what's time? What's space? What's the cause? Uh, and I found myself uh, asking those questions, and I think it was when I was, uh, oh, about 11 or 12 or 10, maybe, uh, off at summer camp, and a few of the counselors there suggested to me, Oh, what you are is a philosopher, Dan. And I didn't even know what a philosopher was. So I thought, oh, okay, cool. You mean you can you can actually do this for a living? Wouldn't that be great? Okay, and then what got you interested in cognitive science? Um, well, cognitive science is uh, didn't even exist when I first got interested in it as a term. It's just the various sciences, the interdisciplinary field of the mind. And uh, uh, as I said, I was interested in what dreams were and optical illusions and visual illusions and hallucinations and uh, memory. And I thought about it just on my own as best I could, and I began to hunt around for uh, uh, books and experiments. And, uh, but m most of my serious work in cognitive science didn't start till I was in graduate school. Okay, now let's talk about religion and the substance of your book. Uh, first of all, anyone picking up a copy of your book might think to themselves, uh-oh, here's another liberal diatribe by an atheist denouncing religion and saying God does not exist. However, I guess that would be an unfair criticism of that, right? Well, that would be an unfair criticism, uh, not because I'm not a liberal and an atheist. I am both a liberal and an atheist. But that's not the point of my book. My point of the book is to say, look, I don't know whether religion is a good thing or not. It may be. But it's a thing. It's a phenomenon. It's a fantastic set of phenomena. They're beautifully designed to do what they do. Let's study them scientifically. We really need to because our understanding of these phenomena is going to be very crucial in the coming century as we deal with the world's problems. Let's look under the hood and see what makes them tick. Okay, now if you were a Martian coming down to analyze Homo sapiens and you realize that, well, gee, all Homo sapien tribes have a religion, there seems to be a deity or some kind of mystical uh, trappings to each of these philosophies, wouldn't you say, therefore, that, well, gee, maybe there's something genetic about all this? Well, uh, something has to explain it. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, Martian biologists would say uh, no, no, no such expenditure of energy and time and, and wealth uh, could possibly uh, persist if it wasn't if it wasn't paid for by, by differential reproduction of one sort or another. So there's probably a genetic base, but of course it could also be that the, that the practices themselves uh, reproduce uh, and jump from host to host, from person to person, and the, the, the survival benefit is to them, not to, the, not to their host. Okay, now let's talk about that specifically. Uh, the essence of evolution is that when different species acquire certain characteristics by mutations or what have you, uh, it helps their survivability. That's they right. then pass these characteristics on to their progeny. There's an advantage. Now, here's the key question, therefore. If societies do spontaneously uh, uh, adopt religions, then if there is an evolutionary basis to this, as you claim, there's an advantage. There has to be some kind of selective advantage that religion gives them. What is that advantage? Well, there has to be a selective advantage that is given to something, not necessarily to them. You're right. Every 
every human culture that's been studied from small tribes to great nations has has religion every human culture already all, ever studied also has the common cold now if you say well gee i wonder what advantage the common cold provides to uh to people the answer is it doesn't provide any it survives because it can survive the advantage is to it to the to the viruses and other pathogens that reproduce and what we have to take seriously is the idea that religions survive because they can now maybe they're really good for us after all in our bodies in each of our bodies there are not just thousands not millions not billions but trillions of tiny organisms without which we could not live they are essential to us but it's their survival that that's how they evolve they evolve uh, uh they have their own genetic fitness and we have to look at the fitness of religious ideas on their own 